Um, please ask questions, otherwise, you know. It, yeah. uh, anyways, uh, my name is Tom Hendrickson. This is Jim Haugen. Um, we are with the Seattle Patent Group, or Jim is the Seattle Patent Group. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, um, I never planned on being an attorney. Uh, I was always in love with visual effects and animation. Uh, but what I realized very quickly when I got into management is that you don't make money making movies. You make your money by owning the ideas behind the movies. And these days, um, movie studios are not really in the business of making movies. They are in the business of uh, creating brands, which means, um, you know, for example, with, with, uh, with Star Wars, right? George Lucas did not make money making Star Wars. He made money off of licensing Star Wars. Toys, bed sheets, video games, action figures. You know, how many hundreds of action, Star Wars action figures have been produced over the last 40 years? Um, you know, so I, that's, you know, I realized that that's what I really wanted to be part of because it's fun helping creative people make the most of their ideas. So um, how many of you are familiar at all with the differences between copyright, trademark, and patent? Anyone? One? Okay, well that's what we're gonna, that's what Jim and I are gonna talk about today, is we're gonna um, try to give you a, a basic understanding of, of, of the different forms of intellectual property and what each one protects. Um, you know, I want you to remember that one common misconception about intellectual property is that Intellectual property is often thought of as being negative rights, which means it doesn't actually give you anything that you don't already have. What it does is it allows you to prevent others from, from doing something, okay? But as such, that means that it's up to you to protect and to watchdog your intellectual property. Nobody else is gonna do it. You know, now there are certain cases uh, where the criminal statutes do get involved, but the government isn't gonna be out there on its own monitoring for you. You actually have to let them know. So um, the three big forms of IP are copyright, patent, and trademark, okay? Copyright and patent are provided for in the US Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eight. Basically, copyright protects creative works, but that, you know, that can go anywhere from uh, from a book, to a movie, to a video game, to a sculpture, to a, fo to a photograph, to architecture. And uh, even the shape of boat holes, I think, can be copyrighted. <laughs> um, patent, well, patent protects in what we normally think of as being inventions, and Jim will talk more about that. Uh, patent does come in a couple of different flavors. Uh, three different <laughs> flavors. And then uh, trademark actually comes out of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So trademark is used as a source identifier for goods and services. And I always like to um, bring this example of Coca-Cola. Okay, There's a couple of different tr trademarks that are embodied in this bottle of Coca-Cola. And as Jim likes to say, Coca-Cola is a multi-billion dollar company and it's sugar and water. Sugar. I looked last year, Coca-Cola's intellectual property is worth $13 billion of their 98 or $99 billion valuation. So well over 10% of the company is mostly trademarks. Certainly one of the most valuable trademarks. Yeah. So another one that comes to my mind is the Nike logo. Yeah. And then another one is the Starbucks logo. Yep. So when you see that, you automatically know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Incidentally, way back when, in the mid-70s, I had the opportunity to visit uh, the Soviet Union. So this was still Iron Curtain kind of days. The only thing there that I recognized was a Coke bottle. <laughs> it was written in Russian, but it had the same font and the same shape. And that was pretty impressive to, uh, to see. Probably Lucky Strike. Hmm? In Lucky Strike. <laughs> I didn't see that, but 
but I mean, I was uh, a young teenager at the time, so I was, and didn't smoke, so I wasn't <laughs> looking for that. But, but Coke bottles uh, really stood out to me as the the one brand I recognized. So how do you put value on that? Then? I mean, um, well, you you look at the value of other similar uh, trademarks or other similar intellectual property, and you try to that's how you try to gauge. Uh, well, that's one way. It's most popular way is through a market comparison. And, and also you look at the sales of your goods and the demand and... Um, I know because uh, sometimes, you know, from a banking standpoint and financing standpoint, you know, you look at the balance sheet and they say, hey, you know, it's yeah. passive and this is worth X amount. And the banker looks at it and goes, yeah, right. You know, and well, you can't touch yeah. it, feel it, eat it, or anything like that. No, you, you can't. I mean, and, you know, in, in some ways... Um, the different forms of intellectual property are interrelated. So, um, yeah, I mean, how much is a patent worth? I, There's a lot of different ways that yeah. people use for valuing them. I mean, it, you're right, because, I mean, that's why, you know, intellectual property is an intangible property. It's nothing that you can physically hold. You know, you can hold a representation, but that's not the same thing as your IP. And... Yeah, what's the copyright on a book worth? Well, you know, the fact is that, that like less than 1% of copyrighted works make any money after 50 years, and yet copyright, uh, the duration of copyright is the life of, life of the author plus 90 years. I mean, that's far in excess of, of what 99% of, uh, of any copyright is, is going to be usable for. You know, but it's, it's only uh, limited works like... Uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, gosh, what else? Uh, maybe Gone with the Wind, uh, Casablanca. Peter Pan. Huh? Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Well, <laughs> yeah, Peter Pan's actually an oddball because in, in Great Britain, uh, Peter Pan, by statute, so by the, uh, the House of Lords and, and, and Parliament, has an unlimited copyright. And it's the only work in the world that, that has this exception right now uh, because any sales of, of Peter Pan... Uh, in England, go to benefit the J.M. Cherry or J.M. Berry Children's Hospital. Um, but okay, with, with copyright, we yeah. Got a question. Yeah. There. Sorry, um, this is yeah. kind of like for the Coca-Cola. Yeah. Um, I saw a video where it was saying that Coca-Cola actually just sold the syrup, right? And he sold it to the bottling companies, and that's like He's... what they did when they first started. And I don't know if that's what they're still doing. And I was just wondering how that kind of like played out with the brand. I hadn't heard anything about that. Um, but the, in, in addition to patent, copyright, and trademark, there are, there are three other forms of intellectual property. There is trade secret, trade dress, and, um, and the rights of publicity. And Jim can talk about the difference between patent and trade secret law. Well, a patent... Yeah, so when we talk about copyrights and trademarks, they are generally quite reasonably priced. <laughs> a copyright, you have a copyright as soon as you create something. You know, you write a book, it's done. You write something on a piece of paper and, and you, you own a copyright in that. But there are advantages to registering. Registration of a single work by a single author for copyright, there are some variations, but typically the federal government charge is 35 bucks. <laughs> mm, I think it went up to 55. Uh, 55 will do a series I oh. think, of, by the same author. Okay. <laughs> I thought it went out. Uh, um, may, maybe yeah. it has. It's very quick. Yeah. Like, you can do it online. Yeah, we broke up with a client, and they didn't want to pay us for the full amount of the work we did on the design. So we offered to, if they paid us in full, to give it to them, and they could assign it to another architect. And they elected not to. Oh. And then we'd seen the work that they're doing with another architect, and it remarkably looks like my <laughs> building. Um, so I talked to my attorney about it, and they're like, just go file a copyright. It took me like 10 minutes. Yeah. It was super easy. Um, so yeah, now what? if they actually build the thing that looks like my building, then there's a chance that I'll get paid for the work that they didn't pay me for in the first yeah. place. So well, that's the thing to remember is that copyright registration is the keys to the courthouse. You can't sue somebody in, for copyright infringement unless you have a copyright registration, which, you know, when you think about the fact that you automatically get 
protection as soon as you create something, and yet you can't, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah, you can't do anything about it until you register. Then it, it's sort of it's like, well, what's the point of having automatic protection if you don't if you have to register to to be able to sue? Because suing somebody is the only way that you can enforce your rights in your intellectual property. So. Yeah. So um, copyright, as I said, is 35 bucks, a couple hundred if you get an attorney to fill out the forms, and uh, you don't have to, but uh, there, there are times where it's worth it. Trademark, you're looking at a bit less than $1,000 typically. Patents, I tell clients, figure that over the 20-year life of a patent, you'll spend twenty-five to 30000 So it, it's kind of the 800-pound gorilla in the room. There's a lot of work involved in getting one and in keeping it after you have it. But it's very valuable, or it can be very valuable if it's uh, for a, a good, solid invention. So what's the benefit from one to the other, or is it actually that the product? They, um, anything that's covered by copyright cannot be covered by patent and vice versa. The, the laws sort of exclude each other. Copyright is for creative works that are non-functional. Patents, have, uh, well, there are some, uh, well, no, uh, really, they're, they're all functional. There are certain things, um, <coughs> let me think, the design of these lights. If you, you could imagine, you know, sketching that out, uh, that is not covered by copyright because it's a functional thing. So there's a different type of patent that you can get for that called a design patent. Most of the time when we talk about patents, we think of utility patents which are for inventions. <laughs> a design patent covers an ornamental design for a useful item. So copyright would be an ornamental design for a non-useful item. A uh, design patent covers a useful item. And then there are also plant patents, which uh, allow you to uh, patent new plants that you, you know, breed or what have you. So how do you determine to choose between the <laughs> utility and the design patent? That, that's something that you want to talk to a patent attorney about to figure out what best protects. Typically, will utility is the most protection in most cases, and then we'll sometimes additionally do design patents. Yeah. So if you developed an art brand, and so say you were a painter and you had all these paintings, and it was your brand, that would be a copyright. That that would be a trademark. Branding are, is trademark. I'll talk more so about like that. A name. It's a it's a it's, it's a name, any, a logo, a symbol, a sound, a smell, a um, color, a color <laughs> even sometimes. So long as it's not functional, a shape. I mean, the shape of this Coca Cola bottle is a trademark, right? And notice that these two different bottles, they're well, obviously different, but they have the same similar shape. And in addition to using the same Coca-Cola script logo. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I, I hear you right, you said smell? Yeah. Can you give an example of the... <laughs> uh, yeah, there, uh, there was a, an oil company right. that made their snowmobile mixing oil smell like cherries when it burned. So as a snowmobile went by, you would smell cherry. That was a trademark. Interesting. Yeah. I got a question. So let's say before... Coca-Cola made the copyright for the bottle. Uh -huh. And let's say 10 years before, a bottle company made a utility patent about you know, a glass vessel with an opening. Who is? Well, you couldn't. You see, but this is a trademark. I mean, it, it, tra it has to be non-functional, though. Uh, the bottle is functional. The, the bottle is, but the shape isn't. Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> So it's the yeah. shape that does it. Anybody can have a bottle, uh, obviously, but they can't have it that shape. For, but even for the shape of the bottle, even as a draw, you'll see Coca-Cola artwork mm -hmm. that has the shape of their bottle as mm -hmm. as part of it. So it isn't even that it's a bottle. It's yeah. Just, right. Yeah. The shape. It's the shape of the yeah. Um, to, to contrast that, though, I know that there was a brand of toilet bowl cleanser that had a hooked neck, right, it's to make it easier to, mm -hmm. to be able to squirt it up uh, underneath the lip of the toilet bowl. Well, you couldn't get a trademark on that hooked neck because that's functional. Could you get a design patent? 
Yep, ah, and, yeah. and, and a utility patent you could get. Um, but, okay, so, Jim, what's the difference? What's the trade secret then? Right, so patents, you, uh, part of the quid pro quo, the part of what we give up to obtain a patent, which gives you the right to exclude others for 20 years from the, the date of filing, is you have to tell the world how to make what you're doing, how to manufacture your product or how to do the process that you're uh, getting protection on or that sort of thing. Is that so they can't come back and say, well, we didn't know if no. they designed the same thing no. or come up with the same thing? Um, the, the reason, and, and I thought that it was pretty cool that this is identified in the Constitution. <laughs> I, I, I was excited when I saw that. I, I should point out I'm Canadian originally, so when, when I went to law school was really the first time that I looked through the Constitution that much, and I thought it was pretty neat that, uh, that patents and copyrights are, are in there. But um, the idea is the purpose of the government granting that limited monopoly is to promote knowledge in the arts. So the idea is, we, the reason that we'll give you that is because you're sharing your idea with the world so that other people can see it and maybe make improvements and that sort of thing. So the idea is they want to promote the level of knowledge and you know, raise everybody by, by sharing that. On the other hand, you can keep something as a trade secret. And that means that you just don't tell anybody. You, you have to have, it has to be something that's of value because it's secret, and you have to make a reasonable effort to keep it secret. But you don't do anything, you don't tell the government about it, uh, you know, there, there's nothing that you do except try and keep it secret. That's, you know, the Coca-Cola formula is one of the famous trade secrets. Um, KFC and their yeah, seven the, yeah, the, secret herbs and spices. Yeah. So um, trade secrets have the advantage of not being limited in time. A patent expires 20 years from the date of filing. It often takes a few years to get it, so you don't actually get 20 years worth of protection, but you get you know, 15 to 17 is pretty typical. Trade secrets don't have that limitation, but if somebody comes up with the same idea or is able to reverse engineer what you've done or anything like that, you have no protection against it. You have protection against somebody taking your idea, you know, who, who is in on the secret. You can then sue the person and, uh, you know, if they uh, go off to a competitor and take it, you may be able to, to sue for that. But if someone independently comes up with it, you have no recourse, whereas with a patent, even so if somebody independently invents it, you can still prevent them from practicing it. Uh, let's see, I suppose all of you have heard of an NDA or non-disclosure agreement? Okay, um, essentially what a non-disclosure agreement is, is it's a contract between the company and you, or between you and another person, that in exchange for access to certain proprietary information, uh, they agree that they will not tell anybody about it. So, um, you know, the way that you enforce a non-disclosure agreement is to sue them for breach of that contract. So first and foremost, an NDA is a contract. And that's why it's very important, uh, you know, to, uh, well, to make sure you have your NDAs in place with, with anybody that might have access to your proprietary information. And pro by proprietary information, I, just, I don't mean just a formula for Coca-Cola or, or a paint formula or something like that. We're talking customer lists, uh, business methods, um, information sources, uh, methodology. I mean, it's, you know, everything related to how you do what you do in your business can be considered to be a trade secret. So, um, so related to trademarks, you know, I mentioned that trademarks are source identifiers in, in, or in commerce, but related to trademarks is trade dress. And typically, when we talk about trade dress, we're talking about packaging and presentation. So, you know, for example, Starbucks has, you know, they have the big counter, they have the, the uh, wood uh, decor, they have um, the, the pickup area. McDonald's has kind of a brown and yellow scheme to make it seem like morning and happy and bright. Taco Bell has the Mexican theme, you know, and so when you go into a Starbucks, you know you're not in a Taco Bell, you know, and you wouldn't go into a McDonald's expecting to order a $500 hamburger. 
you know, trade, you know, that's where trademarks and trade dress, you know, they, they allow you to, to know uh, what kind of goods and services that you expect to get. You know, Tiffany's has the blue box with the bow, right? That's a trademark. Um, and then kind of the, the last form of IP is, is what's called rights of publicity. And, and rights of publicity are mainly a person's uh, right and, and uh, a, well, an interest in using their image and likeness. So um, I, you know, I love this, uh, this figure, this uh, Nick Fury figure from the Disney Infinity series, because to me this embodies every form of intellectual property. Okay, so copyright. You know, what elements of this packaging might be copyrightable based on what we've talked about so far? Yeah, yeah, what else? Oh, maybe. In what context, though? <laughs> well, okay. Well, um, my students have told me that, um, that in the comic book, Nick, Nick Fury was not African American. Okay, so yeah, we've got the design of the figure. The sculpture of the figure is copyrightable. The photo on the, on the top of the package, that would be copyrightable. Um, the, yeah, the design of the logos would be copy. Huh? Well, that's trade dress, though. You know, and then on the back here, we've got, you know, more pictures of, of, of you know, Nick Fury and then a picture of the, uh, of Disney Infinity figures, right? So photographs are copyrightable, right? Uh, you know, this, is, this figure is designed to be plugged into a base and, and then you can play it on the video game. Well, the video game is copyrightable. Um, as far as trademark, we've got multiple trademarks going on here. We've got the Disney Infinity logo, right? We've got this little Spider-Man symbol up here that's, that's used to identify that this character comes from uh, the, the uh, Marvel superheroes. Uh, we've got this Marvel Superheroes logo, right? And then, uh, let's see. You know, okay, so, yeah. Does, does each one instance of a copyright or, or people write up, you know, like 10 claims for that box or? They could. Well, they would file a, a I mean, they, they wouldn't put a copyright on the, on the box, but they could get a copyright on the photographs and on the sculpture and, and on the elements that go into the packaging. So, so they would do 10 different right. applications oh, 10 different to cover each thing. Right. You and, could, and just one thing that I'd like to mention that Tom uh, pointed it out, but I don't know that it uh, was caught. The Disney Infinity, for example, logo can be a copyright. So the design of a logo or anything like that can be a copyright and a trademark. It can be both. Now, um, trademarks come in a couple of different flavors, right? You can get a, a, a trademark on a, on a logo, right, on Disney Infinity, and then you can get a design trademark. So on this, you know, this cursive Disney with the, you know, with the infinity, with that, you know, with the IN in the red box. I mean, that's a separate artistic design uh, trademark, right? But the... The disadvantage to getting a design trademark is that every time you change your design, you have to apply for a new trademark. You know, yeah. Is there any kind of like double jeopardy situation for that? Like if someone's infringing on your logo and you have a design patent and a, or a design copyright and a, then say you sue them for both things, are you suing them for different aspects, I guess? It's tr it just boils down to trademark infringement. And the key thing to, to keep in mind about trademark infringement is that a claim for trademark infringement is based on the likelihood of confusion. How, you know, in the, aver in the mind of the average consumer, how likely is it that they're going to be confused as to the origin of somebody else's goods or services as compared to yours? That's, what you, that's really what you have to prove when it comes to any claim for trademark infringement. Yeah. Well, that's, that goes into trade dress, which is another thing I want to talk, talk about. Trade dress is related to trademark. So, you know, two different figures, same series, right? You can tell at a glance, 
that that this product comes from the same line as this product, right? They both have you know the same shape for the box. They both have the picture of the character at the top. They both have similar placement for the logos. You know, this one has an, Ave an Avengers symbol as opposed to a Spider-Man symbol, but but they both at the bottom. They both say Marvel superheroes, and then they both have the uh, name of the character at the very bottom. So trade dress, you know, would relate to the packaging, the presentation of a product. Even you know, even if you ship uh, goods to a customer through the mail, so long as you ship the product in a unique-looking box, you can claim trade dress protection. You know, that's what Tiffany's essentially does with their blue box. You know, when you buy a, a ring from Tiffany's, it comes in a blue box. Well, that's trade dress, which is, like I said, it's related to trademark. Um, patents. Well, there could be, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there could be patents on the software code related to, to, um, to the chip that's inside the base of this thing. There could be patents related to the, to the software for the video game. There could be, I don't know, well, what, um, what else? It, it's quite possible to have a design patent on the figurine since it has the chip in it that uh, yeah. integrates as well. So both utility and design are possible. Well, basically everything. Pretty much. Well, I'm not quite sure about, um, about trade secret, but Disney might have some method in how they manufacture the figures. I mean, there's not a... Yeah single seam, you know, along the edges of, of, the, of these figures, you know, pass it around. Um, so I don't, I don't really know, maybe they have some sort of trade secret when it comes to how they manufacture the figures. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, and then rights of publicity. Well, obviously Samuel L. Jackson has a strong interest in protecting his, his appearance and his likeness. His voice is very distinctive, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I have a question on like, plagiarism. So, like, a, a popular political figure gave a little speech and then they said she was plagiarizing because she was copying somebody. Would that be copyright law? That's copyright infringement, yes. Ah. And yeah. so then somebody was suing somebody. So that's Some, okay to do that. And... Well, you would, right. Um, but that, okay, that goes into uh, one of the interesting exceptions of copyright law, which is fair use and parody. Um, we can talk a bit about that. Um, so, I guess I'm going to pass it. So, um, does that kind of make sense, what the differences are between the, the different forms of, of intellectual property? I know I was uh, working at a company on the movie Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, um, about 15, uh, yikes, about 17 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and at one point, there was talk about uh, doing uh, 3D scans of the people that worked at the company and then including us as background extra, extras in the movie. Well, somebody in the company started talking about rights of publicity and the company got scared and it killed that idea. And personally, I thought it would have been fun to have been in, in the background of, uh, of that movie, but you know, it never, never happened because of that. But, you know, but how much is the right of publicity of any one of us really worth? I mean, we're not Samuel L. Jackson. You know, we're not Bette Midler. Are we talking about Kim Kardashian? What's that? Well, <laughs> yeah, but she's a celebrity, though. I mean, I don't know why, but <laughs> other than her dad being involved in the OJ case, but I. But um, okay, so one of the uh, one of the exceptions to copyright law. So co you know, copyright prevents others from from copying, distributing or creating a derivative work of some, something that you have created. So a derivative work would be like a, let's say you wrote a book, right? A derivative work would be a sequel to the book, or a Spanish translation of the book, or a large print version of the book. You know, something that's based on a previously existing creative work. Which makes fan fiction interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a big lawsuit happening right now. It's going to try out the end of the month. Uh, because this guy named Alec Peters decided to make a, a fan film based on Star Trek. And based on this five-minute fan film that he made, he went out and he, he got over a million dollars for Kickstarter to make a feature-length film. And, you know, this guy didn't have clean hands. He was doing all kinds of things that, that maybe he shouldn't have. And so Paramount sued him for copyright infringement. 
and it's going to trial at the end of the month. And he's tried to claim fair use. He's tried to claim it was parity. He's, you know, I don't know who's representing this guy, but he's, you know, tried every trick in the book, and yet he got caught with his hand in the cookie jar uh, using part of that million dollars to uh, pay himself a salary and buy tires for his car and pay for his girlfriend's cell phone bill and, you know, all sorts of stuff that you would expect or that you wouldn't expect uh, money like that to be donated for. What's that? A movie producer to do. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, hey, yeah. I've got a quick question. I mean, uh, it just seems like there's people out there, their job is to protect it. I mean, just you know, file for this, file for that. Like when I was designing a web page, well, you can't use that name because we bought the rights to it. I mean, does it get to a point where it becomes so frivolous? It's like, why are you guys doing this? And people question it. As an example, what's going on today? Somebody was, when we talked about this, yeah. they trying to trademark it, uh, the N word. Uh, well, but they just like, you know, government saying, like, we can't do that. So today, um, the Supreme Court is hearing oral arguments uh, for uh, over trademark um, and disparaging terms uh, because of a band in Portland, Oregon. They, uh, uh, they bill themselves as the first all Asian uh, dance rock band and they called themselves the Slants. And uh, the trademark office refused registration of that as a trademark, saying that it was disparaging to Asian people. And the band said, we're Asian. How can it be disparaging to us? And it, today, it is at the Supreme Court. And uh, so well, there's, there's a lot of question of whether the government should be making that decision or not. <laughs> so. Well, and there's uh, also been a long-running debate about the Washington Redskins. Yeah. You know, at various points, that that football team has had its trademarks revoked and then reinstated and then revoked again, and you know, but it's been a question as to whether the term Redskins is um, is disparaging. Uh, Jim and I both went to Seattle University for law school, and at one point, uh, I think the our sports team was called the Chiefs. Well, a few years ago, that got changed to the Red Hawks. You know, uh, probably because of the appearance, they didn't want the appearance of being disparaging. So, but, you know, but I was telling Tom, I... Well, well with trademark, uh, uh, not disparaging, but for trademark infringement, a lot depends on being able to show damages and that sort of thing. Copyright is something to watch out for. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you remember the, um, when people would, uh, what was the company that had downloads for songs. Oh, uh, Napster. Napster. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you heard sometimes of ridiculous amounts uh, that people were getting uh, fined for that. That's because every infringement of a copyright, you can either show damages or take the statutory amount, like just by law, which is $35,000. So $35,000 per incident. And if, you, if they can show that you knowingly were infringing the copyright, which when you're downloading music it is pretty easy, it's $150,000. So every song was $150,000. And well, you, know, you had grandmas whose kids were coming in and downloading a bunch of stuff on her computer and she didn't know anything about it and getting millions of dollars in, uh, in fines. But, uh, well, a couple of things I want to point out real quick. Um, with trademark, you know, the reason why you don't have trademark trolls um, is because in trademark you actually have to be using the, the symbol or the word or the phrase in commerce. And you, you have to provide a statement of use. So trademark doesn't expire as long as you are using, uh, using your, your trademark in, in commerce, right? And you have to file a, a form with the government about every five years, every five to 10 years, stating that yes, in, yes indeed, I am using this product in commerce, here's my proof. So a picture of, of your, your bottle, of, you know, a, a end cap on a, in a store, something that shows the trademark office that you are genuinely using the trademark. Um, because if you don't use it in commerce after three years, somebody else can come in and make a claim for the same mark. And that's what's called an abandonment of a trademark. Yeah. 
I've got a question. What about um, when people come up with a product name? Um, let's say the sun. You know, let's say somebody would mm -hmm. use the word sun as mm -hmm. that's my product. For for words in a everyday situation. What what's the can you use a word like that? Well, trademarks have a spectrum of distinctiveness, okay? So you have uh, on one end um, generic terms that can never be trademarked, and then on the other hand, completely arbitrary and, or fanciful marks. And then it kind of, you know, in between would be something that's descriptive or something that's suggestive, mm -hmm. you know, and in certain cases, you actually have to be using the term in commerce related to a particular good or service for a period of time, usually about five years, in order to show that, yes, uh, you know, I have been using, yeah, I have acquired distinctiveness because of my use of the term in, com in commerce. So you can take a ordinary word, right? But things like Amazon, well, what does the word Amazon have to do with shipping of, exactly. of products? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. And Apple yeah. computers. Yeah. 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 So, so you can use so you uh, can. generic terms, mm -hmm. but not if they relate to what you're doing. So if you were, uh, a fruit stand, you might have trouble getting Apple as a trademark because your competitors would have to use that term to describe their products. Trademarks are never meant to give you a competitive advantage that, uh, which disadvantages your competitors um, because they aren't allowed to use that trademark. A trademark should be arbitrary in that sense. But trademarks only apply to specific classes of goods and services. So the USPTO is, has like 34 different classifications, right? And that's why you can see Acme Shoes and Acme Auto Repair, right? Because they, they're two different, two completely different products or services that occupy different channels of commerce that would, you know, appeal to different customers, right? And hence would have a low likelihood of confusion. Right. So is that why I couldn't trademark simply chic for a clothing line? Because it directly it, it could be di considered descriptive, okay. yeah. And you have to watch out for um, for inherently famous marks, right? Like, like what I said, the movie studios are out to create brands. Well, a brand is a trademark that encompasses more than one product or service. I mean, the goal of every trademark owner is to is to own a brand, because with a brand, you know, Disney. Disney is the most valuable brand on the planet because they own Star Wars, because they own Marvel, they own Henson, uh, the Muppets, they own uh, uh, God, Pixar, I mean, what's that? ABC. Yeah, ABC. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know uh, uh, I was at Disney University for training one time after our company got bought out by Disney and and uh, the, the lady asked who our favorite Disney character was, and one of the people in our company said Sam Donaldson. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I ain't going to say about. Uh, so, but, you know, but with a brand that's inherently famous, you would never get a, be able to get a trademark on anything Disney related, even if, it, even if Disney had never occupied the, the good or service, because Disney's inherently famous. Right? Same, you know, same thing with um, probably with Warner Brothers or with, you know, um, or with Apple, you know? Apple's made it pretty darn hard to, like, you know, there was a huge um, uh, struggle with, uh, with the record company. well, yeah, with the Beatles, right? Because the yeah. Beatles had Apple Music back in the 60s. That was, their, uh, that was their studio, right? And so Apple Computer comes along and the Beatles said, whoa, you know, we don't we don't want you guys using the Apple trademark. We're yeah, we've had it for a long time. And Apple said, okay, uh, fine. Well, well, we'd like to use the mark, but we promise we'll never do anything with music. <laughs> you can tell how long that lasted. <laughs> so I mean, I presume they they came to some settlement, but um, but you know, and that's that's where trademarking something can get really expensive. For example, with a rock band, right? You know, you, uh, you have a rock band that wants to go out and it wants to do live shows, right? And then it wants to, to sell CDs. Uh, and it wants to sell T-shirts and hats. Well, you know, uh, the USPTO charges $225 for each class of goods and services, right? So automatically, you're, you're already looking at over $700 or around $700 just 
in registration fees. But if you're registering it as different classes, so one could be clothing, one could be music, everything that's apparel would fall into that classification. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you wouldn't have to. So if you have uh, like hats and, or sorry, if you had uh, shirts and sweaters and anything that would fall into the clothing uh, class, you wouldn't have to go out and get a separate registration for because you're already covered. Now, the tricky part with that is that when you register, even though it's under one class, you have to identify the goods and services that you're providing. And it is quite possible for you to use that class of, that apparel falls under and say hats, and then a year later you decide to make scarves. It's not covered by what you have, even because though... Because it wasn't first right. registered as that. Can right. you go for in the, and modify that? It's a new registration. Okay. So it's best to cover, uh, and of course you can't register it. Uh, you, there is an intent to use. So if you're planning on doing it, you can uh, list multiple things. But the um, you can't be a hat company, register apparel, and put knowing that you're never going to do anything but right. hats and go hat shoes, scarves, right. jackets. Yeah, and what happens is if you are planning on doing that. You can file, as I said, what's called an intent to use application, and then uh, after your uh, after it's approved by the patent office, you have a, a some time to show that you're actually using it, and you can extend that up to a, a total of about two and a half years. But if you don't show them that you're using it within two and a half years of it being approved, it's cancelled again. But trademark is based on use, so the sooner you start using something. In goods, in uh, in commerce. in commerce, the better off you'll be. You'll be because if you can show evidence that yeah, I didn't, you know, maybe I didn't uh, register for my trademark until two years later, but I started using it on this date. Here's my evidence that I started using it. It is still a defense. Okay. okay? Because often we work with small com small businesses <laughs> that can't afford to go out and get multiple registrations all at the same time, but they they want to protect their mark and they sh they want to start somewhere. Yes. No, the, I'm sorry, the, the, a new what? A soup. new soup. Soup? Like a chicken noodle. Uh, would be a patent. It would be a patent, but if you came up with, let's say, gram, Granny's Soup, right? Mm -hmm. Granny's Soup would be a trademark. Okay, and then I would want to get a contract, an NDA contract. With any employees that you might have. Oh, okay. It's, it's only between its business associates that you would want to get the non-disclosure. Or a supplier. Or a supplier, yeah. It can be nuanced and um, the laws can vary state to state and quite often uh, I, I see a lot of people grab contracts off the web and they don't pay attention to which state it's for and that kind of thing. So if you're serious about doing things in business, it's worth getting a professional to review that sort of thing because not having it wrong can be so I mean, I, I've seen, since I've been doing this about six years now, um, I've seen probably three businesses ruined because they didn't get someone to look at the contracts they were using. Yeah, you would never trust yourself to do brain surgery, right? <laughs> So, you, you know, why, so why would you trust, your, you know, trust yourself to, to create a contract, to write a contract? I mean, you know, there's reasons why people like us go through multiple years of schooling and then multiple years of additional education. You know, but, you know, even though I'm an attorney, I would never write a will, right? Because it's an area of law that I don't know anything about. Or maybe I know the basics, right? But, but not every attorney is created equally, right? And, and there's so much subtlety. Uh, I remember in my first year of law school, I saw a news story about a contract where the placement of a comma cost a company over a million dollars. And the, the, what happened is it was uh, a telephone or a power company had uh, contracted with a provider of poles, telephone poles. And they, uh, after they signed the contract, the price of poles changed dramatically and the, uh, the power company wanted to get out of the contract and they found that 
the clause for terminating the contract had a comma in the right place for them that allowed them to uh, to get out uh, because the, it, was, it was meant to be that you had to do it for five years and then you had the option of doing it, uh, of changing it uh, year by year. Wow. But the, because of the placement of the comma, they were able to get out of it after one year. Wow. Sir, yeah. So, talking professionals, it, it seems like a lot of money always, probably, for somebody who wants to start a business and wants to have a patent. You know, and then earlier you said like twenty-five thousand dollars, twenty. I mean, you know, there's no, there's no limit. So, how can a normal person even thinking about it? That's a a tough question, and it really depends on your business model. Um, I, I've dealt with stay-at-home moms, and I've dealt with startups that have gotten funding and that kind of thing. Uh, but it really depends on your business model, how important your invention is to that. Um, for example, if you want to, if you came up with a, a brilliant idea for a new tire for an earth mover. How did you know? <laughs> you're probably not going to be able to even prototype one yourself, right? So you're probably going to have to license it. If you need to license it, you're probably going to need a patent if you want to make any money. So the, there's a certain amount where you have to believe in what you're doing, yeah. that you will make it successful. And uh, what I tell people is, OK, a patent, uh, uh, it's somewhat front-end loaded. Uh, you know, the, you're looking at 7,500, 8,000 or so uh, up front um, to get the application. Then usually it's a few years, and then you've got a few bumps of a few thousand, like two or 3,000. And then uh, it settles down again. And then after a few years, there's $1,000. A few years later, there's 2,000. A few years there's, later, there's 4,000. So it is spread out somewhat. But I tell people, over the, the life of that patent, you're going to probably spend 25 or 30,000. And, and certainly, if you work with some of the large law firms, it'll go a lot higher than that. But if you think that you will make $100,000 or more on your invention over that 20 years, it's probably worth getting a patent. The 25 to 30, I think, is a pretty good estimate. The 100,000 is arbitrary, because that's really where it depends on your, your business model. If you're licensing, maybe 50,000 is a better uh, thing, because you're probably not going to make anything unless you've got the, the patent. If it's something that you could keep as a trade secret, maybe it's better to, to say, well, unless I'm going to make 200,000, I don't want to invest in it. So it really depends. Do, do banks help you? I you know, uh, an inventor? No. Yeah, I'm, not. I'm a former banker. I mean, for 25 years, we don't help anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, our job is not. Our job is to lend money. Our job is to make sure we have a fiduciary responsibility to the depositor to say, once we lend the money out, we we've done our job as far as underwriting and risk mitigation, and um, and our job is that we just send them to these guys. You know, to these two. Do you have a price? We just send the, you know, the attorneys and all that. But the funny thing is, talk about legal documents, talk about commas, when you're talking about that, you know, you, uh, the promissory note is, is a, it's a document that's produced by what's called Laser Pro. And I don't know if you guys ever read that kind of document, but it's like, I don't even understand what I'm reading you know, that because it's so much affirmation of this, something like this, this, and I was like, I, I, I think after you sign it, you've already, you're already delinquent. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah. to put banks in perspective, I've been in business 20 months, and the only loans I can get, there's only like one or two banks who will loan us money, and we have not an insignificant um, cash flow, but because we're not in business two years, banks won't even look at us, and the ones that we do get are SBA loans, mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of you know hoops you have to jump through, okay. um, so it's just kind of, you know, Banks yeah. are in the business to make money. And yeah, even though, they're not investors. Even though my business is going gangbusters, they're still like, well, let's mm -hmm. wait until April. Yeah. Yeah. In April, you know, if things stay good in April, then, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll give you some money. But, but most kinda, of my clients that want funding go to angel investors. And angel investors want and a bunch they, of money in return because it's high risk. They want you to yeah. 
they wouldn't turn down yeah. Disney at exactly. this point because yeah. they have a track record mm -hmm. and they're exactly. successful. They exactly. want those yeah. people to walk through their door. They're not based on small businesses. Yeah. So in two years, they told me that 20% of my cash flow, they'll give me as a line of credit. Just mm. go. Like, no questions asked, here's your cash flow, we'll give you 20%. But um, it's, it's great. Yeah. All right, well, with a few minutes, the... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I got a question. I was wondering, like, why do you patent? Oh. <laughs> it, it, patents are very extensively examined. So an examiner at the patent office will look through the world's literature to try and see if there's anything that's been done like that before. So uh, prior art, what we call uh, prior art, which means someone who's done something uh, the same or similar before, can be from anywhere in the world it can be publications in any language. So it takes them a while to, to do that. And the examiners are normally experts in the area that they're examining. Um, so they've got a lot of personal knowledge and a lot of skill in searching for that sort of thing. So it's pretty typical that uh, in, the process is um, that if, if I'm going to write a, a patent application, I'll meet with the client, have a disclosure so that I can learn what the invention is. I'll go off and draft an application then review it with the, the client, and we iterate through that until we're all happy. Then we submit it. Uh, it gets assigned to an examiner. Typically, uh, it, it can vary with which technology unit it goes to in the uh, patent office. It's quite often two to three years before we even hear back from them the, the initially. But if it's like a clear like distinction of like, this is like brand new, like this is... It, it, it takes them that long to get around to assigning it to an examiner and so on. Some of the groups are very quick. I, I've gotten one back in about four months this year, but that's an exception. Uh, I, I've had, when you submit, you get an estimate of how long it's going to take. I've had estimates of five years before we would hear back from them. They that's actually your, beat, beat those. But that's your patent pending. You yeah, still yeah the, the day that you're, you file, you are patent pending. Right, but even the patent pending has value. Yeah, it, it can have that. But uh, then we, uh, when, the ex when we do hear back from them, it is almost always a rejection that they'll find something, even if it's stupid, to, to reject you on. Then we have to respond to that. And then, uh, well, the average patent application that is successful, that goes on to be, uh, become a patent, gets rejected 2.8 times in the process. Each of those cycles takes typically six to nine months. So we get rejected. We have three months, but we can take up to six months if we pay a little extra to respond to it. Then the examiner will take a few months to respond back to us and, and so on. So, and then, uh, you know, finally, you may have a, a patent in hand. So is the patent cost in reality, is it legal fees or is it the actual have it pushed through? It's both. There, there, are, uh, there are quite a few fees that go to the patent office. Uh, most of it, probably two-thirds, are the, the lawyer fees. It takes a lot of labor to, uh, to do it. To write a patent application, I figure it takes about 40 hours of actual writing, and we do that over about three months because there's a lot of thought involved, too. There's, there's real constraints on, on what you can do in it. So I read so many things about patent already, but I read some who said, the less words, the better for patents so and a picture paints a I, I, I thought of, uh, I, I, I watched a lecture where I thought they described this very well. If we wanted to get a patent on a coffee cup, okay, if your specification said a coffee cup, I mean, that's probably descriptive enough that most people would understand it, you're not going to get a patent on that because there's too much prior art uh, and yeah. so on. If, on the other hand, you, uh, your specification was e uh, the equivalent of a CAD program that could uh, you know, have a, a CAM manufacture that cup. It would probably be megabytes of data, uh, but so, uh, and you'd probably get a patent on it because it would be very specific and, not, and you know, somewhat different from anything that went before. But if you moved that handle a millimeter, that would be a substantial difference from everything that's in there. So, uh, the megabytes that you're describing is probably too much. So somewhere between those three words and the megabytes of data is the right length for it. 
And that's where a patent attorney adds value, is knowing how much detail to put in there. How about the person who really came up with the coffee cup, with the mug, with the handle? <laughs> if you would be the first person and he writes a patent by itself and it says, this is a coffee mug with a handle, would that be enough? Maybe. It depends on what else was around before that. If there were, if there were beer it's mugs nice. with handles, yeah. that might mm -hmm. be uh, similar. If, uh, what I like to use as an example is, um, well, there's two criteria that, uh, but there's a lot of criteria, but there's two things I like to, uh, to point out, is that a patent uh, has to be novel mm -hmm. and what's called non-obvious. And this obviousness doesn't mean obvious in the normal English sense. There's a, a technical sense of it. And the idea is an examiner reading your patent application, if they say, oh, someone already did this, that's a novelty rejection. If they say, well, I don't know anyone who's done this, but this person did this piece of it, and this person did this piece of it, that's an obviousness rejection. If they, if they decide someone working in this industry would know to combine those two things to come up with what you've got. And so most of the rejections that we deal with end up being obviousness rejections. And sometimes the examiners stretch a bit further than, I, than they probably should mm -hmm. to find things that they say this is you know, based on what was done there. Um, so that's usually, they'll almost always find something that they consider prior art. Okay. What's your recommendation with the technology boom and the people are building apps and all these things? I mean, they're, they're so really software, uh, software is challenging to get patented right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, there was a Supreme Court case called Alice that uh, if you read much on, on patents, and uh, you may have heard of, and they basically said that the company that was uh, that had this patent had gone too far. That uh, you know it wasn't really novel. Unfortunately, they the way that the court worded it, lower courts and the patent office read it to mean software wasn't uh, novel for it basically, and so they started. Uh, canceling patents that had been recently issued for software. They stopped approving them. It, it was just a, a complete mess. And it, as so often happens it, in patents, the, the pendulum had sort of swung hard to, no, you can't get software patented. It's coming back now. It's getting a little bit easier to get uh, software through. There, there are particular approaches that we take to writing it to, uh, to try and get it. but. Uh, so it's better than it was even a year ago, and it's getting better, but it is challenging to get, uh, get apps done. Well, I know we're running a little bit late, but yeah. I just want to touch on something that's really important that, that Jim mentioned, about this idea of licensing. Okay, So a license is permission to come on or to use the property of another. So the way that applies to intellectual property is that somebody... You know, if somebody wants to use your, pro use your copyrights, trademarks, or patents, they have to get permission from you. So that's what's called a license. Um, I'm going to use Lego Batman here as an example. Uh, the video game developer is a company called Traveler's Tales. Okay, So um, the, uh, the, uh, copyrights for, the copyrights and the, uh, the trademarks for Batman are owned by Warner Brothers and DC Comics. I guess DC Comics is owned by Warner Brothers. So if Traveler's, Traveler's Tales says, hey, we have an idea for a video game. We'd like to make a Lego Batman video game. It's like, okay, that's great. What do we have to do? Okay, well, first we should go get permission from Lego. So they have to go and pitch to the Lego company to say, hey, you know, we'd like to make a Lego Batman video game. And Lego has to decide whether or not they want to license out their IP in the Lego bricks for a video game. But even if Lego says okay, then Traveler's Tales still has to go to Warner Brothers and to DC and say, hey, you know, we'd like to create a Lego video game. Can we use your characters? Can we use storylines from your movies? Can we um, use your trademarks? And, they, and so Warner Brothers has to decide whether or not it's okay. But the idea behind a license is essentially that a license is a 
a symbiotic relationship where the person, you know, let's say you've got Batman and you've got a shoe manufacturer, right? So the shoe manufacturer says, okay, I'm doing okay selling shoes, but you know what? I could sell a lot more shoes if I put the Batman logo on them. And so, you know, shoe manufacturer goes to Warner Brothers, says, hey, we'd like to sell Batman themed kid shoes. Warner Brothers is gonna say, okay, well, show us, show us uh, your business record. Show us your, your past history of selling shoes. Show us your, your business plan. Show us how, how, it's gonna, uh, how many more shoes you're gonna be able to sell if you put the Batman logo on it. And so a uh, shoe manufacturer goes back and says, okay, you know, you know, we think we're gonna be able to sell 100,000 units of Batman shoes. And Warner Brothers is gonna look at, the, at, at that and try to assess the risk and say, okay, we'll pay us $50,000 up front and then pay us 10 cents on every pair of shoes. The 50,000 up front is the guarantee and then the, the 10 cent on every pair of shoes is the license fee. You know, that is a contract. And there's a ton of ways that um, that, that can be structured. But um, I guess one, one thing that I wanna get across to every single person is that um, in any contract, the most important provision is the exit provision. What are you gonna do if the contract fails? What are you gonna do if the parties wanna get out? Uh, Jim and I recently had a client that went to k &L Gates, one of the top law firms in Seattle, to set up their business. In the Articles of Incorporation, in all of the, uh, the bylaws, in all that paperwork that k &L Gates generated, Oh, Perkins Coie, sorry, <laughs> Perkins Coie. Don't want to defame uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, All right, but Perkins Coie, right? In all of the business paperwork that Perkins Coie created, they never included an exit clause. They never set, you know, put, or they never specified what was gonna happen if the, if the owners of the business decided that they didn't want to be in business anymore. So be it a, lic a license to use your intellectual property, be it any sort of a business contract, Always, always make sure to have an exit clause. Because always be sure to find out what the exit clause is. That too, yeah. <laughs> if you're signing an, somebody I else's. Business two years ago, yeah. and it was not fun. I had to give away a big chunk of the money that I invested. Right. And I didn't even know it was there because all the stuff I was looking at was in the front and it was in the very, very back from like 50 years ago. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so if I can pass on one piece of advice about business contracts, always, always be on the lookout for that exit clause. Always make sure it's either in a contract that you're drafting or having drafted or, or be on the lookout for it if you're signing somebody else's. Because, um, yeah, it's nice if everything goes right, but chances are it won't. So. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you guys. I appreciate your... Uh...